Hi, good evening, um, and welcome to More Than Words Day Three. Um, <coughs> as I've been saying over the last couple of days, this 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 is a storytelling festival that has been dedicated to the memory of a dear friend of many of ours, Ankit Chadda, who uh, was at the loft several times uh, and who really stole our hearts with his magical work. Uh, Ankit was a writer, a researcher, and a performer, and. Uh, what we're trying to do uh, with this festival is to sort of carry on the work that he did um, and bring people together um, through through stories and through the work of, of several people. Uh, the intention of today's event is, uh, it's not traditional storytelling as you can tell, but we wanted to have uh, somebody to come and tell the story, some, a story of something else, uh, just like uh, literature, economics, geography, uh, so we, we wanted Latika to come and share her work with us, her story, and her work with, uh, ecological, with the ecological concerns of our country. So Latika is here for that. And a big thank you for Latika, to Latika for coming here. Just to be thank here. you, sir. Thank you to be here. Uh, I'm going to quickly introduce um, Latika. Latika Nath is a wildlife biologist with a deep fill on tiger conservation and management from the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit and Christ Church at the University of Oxford. Latika is the first woman wildlife biologist in India to hold a doctorate on tigers and enter the field of tiger con conservation at a time when no holistic scientific work had been done on the tiger in India, apart from a study in 1968. She has spent over 25 years working at the grassroots for tiger conservation, eventually changing focus from academic work to working with the tribal communities in the buffer zone of Kana Tiger Reserve and the Forest Department of the Government of India for tiger conservation. She has established the renowned Singinawa Jungle Lodge and through the Singinawa Foundation worked on education, health, art and alternative energy programs for the tribal villages in that region. Her life and work has been featured on National Geographic Television in, in, a, in, in a documentary as well as on the Discovery Channel, channel, channel on the program Wild Things. Latika has um, contributed to several films on the BBC, as well as the cover story on tigers for the Year of the Tiger on the in the National, national Geographic magazine. Latika has worked with numerous international organizations, including IUCN, UNDP, UNFPA, and ICMOD, ICIMOD, on many species, including the Asian elephant, the Gangetic Dolphin, the Arna or Wild Buffaloes, and high altitude mammals in the, in the Kanchanjunga area. Her areas of interest focus, her areas of interest include landscape ecology and the resolution of human wildlife conflict. For the past few years, Latika has been traveling and photographing the cat species of the world and has photographed tigers, leopards, lions, cheetahs, jaguars, snow leopards, and the clouded leopard. She's an ardent traveler, photographer, diver, and has spent exploring, and has spent a lot of time exploring the myriad wildlife places of the planet. Uh, when I wrote to Latika, she was in Botswana. <laughs> and uh, she said, I don't have much range, so can you send me a WhatsApp instead? And so this happened over the last few weeks uh, and um, through mm -hmm. broken conversations on WhatsApp. So thanks so much. My pleasure. <laughs> So good evening. Um, can everybody hear me? Is it good? Okay. So I'm. Um, I wasn't very sure of exactly what I should say and what stories I should tell. Um, living in the jungle, one has lots of stories. One tells over the campfires and um, you know different subjects, different fields. I didn't know what would interest everyone. So I thought. The simplest thing for me to do today is to talk about my story, what I do, what drives me, um, what my passions are, and why I've ended up doing what I'm doing the way I'm doing it. Um, a lot of people ask me what it is that I do, and what does being a conservation ecologist involve, and what is it like being a wildlife photographer? Those are the sort of standard questions I get. Um, can we actually switch these off? These are the ones we need to switch off. Yeah, great. Okay, so 
um, I live in the wild. I've spent 27 years in and out of jungles. And I lead this dual life where I spend huge amounts of time, maybe eight months of the year in the field. And I come into cities and then, you know, I'm a part of mainstream life. And it's, uh, I mean, to, to tell you the type of contrast I go through, I one evening took off in a little plane, which was a four-seater from a runway in the middle of Botswana, where we had to shoo the impala and uh, baboons off with a stick and landed in Dubai, which was the other extreme of civilization. <laughs> you know, two sunsets, two consecutive evenings, totally different. And really, the only reason I do it is because I want to. It's the only thing I really want to do. It's, I can't imagine not doing this. Okay, so, so no obstacle is an obstacle because it can't be an obstacle because if I allowed it to be an obstacle, I would stop being me and stop doing what I want to do. So things, there are hurdles and you, and you work around them. But what I want to do is work in the wild. And that's really what I spend my time doing. That's me with um, one of Jane Goodall's chimpanzees in Tanzania. Or waiting for a snow leopard up in the Himalayas. Minus 25 degrees centigrade. Um, this was approximately 17,800 feet above sea level. And um, I spent more than a month walking every day trying to get a glimpse of a snow leopard. So lots of patience um, and learning to be with myself. I need to like myself as a person if I spend this kind of time with myself. Because the minute there's someone else there, it's a disturbance. So it's almost always me alone or with one guide. This is how we spend time. The person in the front is me. Uh, you have to take my word for it. And that's my big 800 mm lens. And we had heard a snow leopard up, right up on top of the mountain. And it was a pin prick. And we got a neck ache looking up like that. So we just finally lay down and looked up because that was the only way to do it. And we waited for something like seven hours. And then we finally saw the snow leopard. And it came down and walked right down. I'm one of the mad idiots of the world who actually does a lot of stuff on foot. And I've walked and photographed elephant. I've been on foot with tigers. This is a pack of wild dogs. I've photographed lions on foot. I photographed um, snow leopards. And my next trip is going to be Puma in Chile. That's a hyena in um, Ethiopia. So I, you know, it's different things. Um, diving, I do a lot of underwater photography. Uh, my next trip, major dive trip is going to be to the Galapagos, where I'm going to um, photograph underwater life as well as the terrestrial things. Birding in the Northeast. It all started when I was 21. And I went over to a friend in Delhi and said, could I borrow your gypsy, please? Because those days, the gypsy was the best 4 by 4 around. And I had been, lived a very protected life with my parents. And I decided that I needed to go to Madhya Pradesh to study tigers. And I didn't have a j car of my own at that time. So I went to this friend's house, borrowed his car, and drove from Delhi through Chambal and Morena and Gwalior to Bandhavgarh. Took me two days. And my mother was so paranoid, she gave me my Aya to go with me. <laughs> so there was my Aya and me and we went around and the, there was a problem with the gypsy battery and every time there was a big bump, it would rub against the bonnet because it wasn't screwed down properly and then it, there would be sparks and then the whole thing would have this flame coming right through the bonnet. So it was very interesting and then, and then the horn would take off periodically, it would short circuit and it would just, you know. So we made our entrance in style into Bandhavgarh and the next day I sent the maid home because, you know, she was paranoid about bears jumping in and mauling her. She was paranoid about getting out of the room at night. She was paranoid about everything and I told my mom it's not going to happen. 
I'm sending her back. My mom arrived within a week to check whether I was okay. <laughs> so this is early days in Bandhavgarh. Um, I had my own elephant. I had 24 hour permission. I was uh, often the only person in the park. And um, I had, I used to walk, I used to be on my elephant, I used to sit in hides. I would spend days and nights in the park for five years continuously. I actually lived with the tigers and you know go through bush and scrub. I started using camera traps which I made myself with the help of some people in the IIT Delhi and um, that was the first time camera traps had been used in India for monitoring tigers and this is what many of my days are like. So I chose to be a conservation ecologist, nice word. Um, it sounded really good, I decided when I was about six. My parents thought I'd learned a new word and in a few days I would become a pilot or a nurse or a train driver but it never happened. I just knew this is what I wanted to be and the reason I chose it is really simple. I just wanted to live life without regrets. I don't want to get to a ripe old age and say I wish I had done that. So I worked hard, I made lots of money and now I'm systematically blowing it up doing all the things I want to do. I assure you it's very satisfying. <laughs> and if you're happy and you've blown up all your money you can go back because you've had such a great time you can go back and start again make some more money and repeat the whole process. You know it's just it really works well. So this is me and this is what I do. It wasn't easy. When people looked at me, they wouldn't believe that I was this person doing research on tigers. You know, the normal perception is there has to be some sort of unkempt looking man or boy, nice, you know, beard, uh, a jhola or a little backpack and you can, that's it. And people walk to me and say, we want to meet the tiger researcher and I'd say, yes, how can I help you? No, we want to meet the man who's the tiger researcher from the Wildlife Institute. No, I'm the tiger researcher. It just would not click. And um, I had a lot of problems. It's not been smooth sailing. Um, people were very threatened by my ability to ask questions. I came from a very privileged background. I admitted right up front, not apologetic. My dad was um, the director of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and special advisor to Mrs. Gandhi for 19 years on wildlife. So he was responsible for setting up the Wildlife Institute of India. I grew up around all of the conservation greats of the country and those are the people I knew. I either knew doctors or I knew conservationists and really early on it made so much sense to work in beautiful forests with wonderful animals instead of being in some horrible government hospital with gloomy corridors stinking of different medicines. You know, so it just, that was it, that what decided me right in the beginning. And um, they called me the Tiger Princess of India in the year 2001 when National Geographic decided to come and make a film about me and my work because I was the first woman in the world, not just the first woman in India, but the first woman in the world with a doctorate on tigers. So yeah, that was a big first. So um, you know, I've spent my dad being a really outdoor type of person. I was about three weeks old when they first took me on my first fishing trip apparently. And I went in a basket on, on my maid's head. So being in the jungle was not new. But being away from home for five years, living in the forest, eating dry rations and whatever else I could get, um, and, and forest officials and park directors who didn't know what to do with me. You know, they didn't know whether to post a guard on duty outside my room or to have me return to base camp every day and was, you know, was I going to be safe because Madhya Pradesh in those days was not an easy place to be. You know, it was, it was fairly backwards and you still had this whole Thakur culture where the, the guys from Riva would come and they would really terrorize the tribals. It was, it was awful and they didn't know what to do with me. So I just, you know, was there and I, I actually lost um, my INLAC scholarship because 
when I went for the scholarship and people looked at me, this I was in the last three. And he, this man looked at me and he said, you know, you can't work in the field. You're just not capable of it. You don't look the kind who could put up with any hardship. And he didn't give me the scholarship. And I went back two years later, got to the final round, and then turned down the scholarship, but gave him the proof that I had been in the field and did all the work. But I got other scholarships from people who believed in me. But, you know, there was this constant thing of you don't look the part. And, and that's something you face a lot in India. You just don't look the part. So, I was there in the jungles and I had my tigers. And they were like members of the family. I could wake up, you could wake me up in the middle of the night and say, tell me where so and so is. And I would take you there and we could wait little bits, you know, half an hour, 40 minutes. And we would find the tiger. It was not a problem. So I knew where 37 of them lived. I knew their behavior, how they moved, what their quirks were. I really could actually tell you everything about the tiger. So I would tell you that it would leave point A and get to point D via point B and C. And if they would stopped on the way, there were two water holes at this point and this point, or they made a kill and what was going on. So it was, it was a great degree of familiarity. And with some of the tigers, I developed a relationship. So I had, for instance, there was this very famous tiger called Sita. And um, she was sort of the matriarch of Bandhavgarh at that time. And she would wait for us to arrive and, you know, deposit her cubs with us and lie down and go to sleep and or walk off and know that the cubs are okay. Mm -hmm. And we'd actually got to the point where if my hand was hanging out of the car with a little white cloth, the cubs would come right up, you know, and I spent that kind of time with them. And it took many, 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 many months to get to that point because you have to build the trust. So there were days I would be waiting for 13 hours, 16 hours. I think 16 and a half hours is the longest that I have waited. And you wait without moving, without doing anything, because you, you don't want to disturb the moment. And I worked, as I said, days and nights. That's one of the camera traps I had made on top. The bottom picture is a very important picture for me, because it was one of the first few pictures that I got with a photograph of a tiger whose paw had been caught in a bear trap. And he'd lost his front right paw. And that was proof that there was poaching going on. And I went with this proof to Delhi. I went to the minister and I gave him the file. The file disappeared. Nothing ever happened. But um, at least I had the proof and I knew what was going on. And it was, um, Bandhavgarh has extreme temperatures. So it goes from about 45 to 48 in the summer. And when you're sitting on a rock face waiting for a tiger in 48 degrees centigrade, you touch the rock and you get blistered. It's unbelievable and it goes all the way down to minus five and you get sheet frost in the winters so in the space of six months you're going from extreme heat to extreme cold and um, working at night I'd be the only person in the park with my driver and my I had this local boy who was my field assistant and they had this line that was their mantra memes up you go in front, we're behind you all the way. <laughs> so it was, it was very simple, you know. It was very straightforward. So when we put up camera traps like that, we would be at a water hole, which would be in, in sort of a, a dead end. And many times I would walk in front and I would talk loudly and the tiger would come rushing out and jump up onto the rocks and run off. And you would see the water marks of the animal as he's just gone and my two faithful followers were just behind <laughs> me so yeah that was um, but you know it's not always about beautiful families and beautiful tigers as I said you I showed you that picture and when I first encountered one of my tigers served up dead out of a sack I wanted to kill someone I really, truly wanted to kill someone. I wanted to put them in a mincer and make mince meat out of them. The rage, it's like your family members been killed. That rage is something that I cannot explain. And, and yet, 
I had to understand that they, these were people who were doing it not because they wanted to but because there was no option in their life had got them to this point where that was the only solution. It took me a long while to actually understand this, to figure out that yes, it was wrong and yes, I was mad and yes, I needed to kill the person, but I also needed to find a solution. And that was a big part of growing up for me. And another big part of growing up for me was understanding what life as a villager is like on the edge of a park. You know, as scientists, we collect data and we're very dispassionate and we present statistics and, you know, prey predator information and crop predation and whatever. All that is fine. The day I leased an acre of land and grew some wheat and in one night, five days before harvesting, the deer came and finished it that day. I understood what the anguish and frustration and pain of these people is. Okay? And I was doing it just for the pleasure of it. These people actually dependent on it for six months of their food. You know, and we just don't in India, we just don't get it. There is no crop insurance. You know, we're just not dealing with it enough. It's not happening and I've, it's been 30 years and it's still not happening. Little movements happen, some park directors are good, some state government will do something, but it all fizzles off and nothing happens. It's, it's a really, really tough world. And I lived in Kana for many years and spent about 10 years without actually leaving Kana. I would be in Kana and I would just go, you know, visit Delhi, visit the UK, do whatever for a month and come back and live in Kana. And I had this lodge called Singinava, which was this plot of land that I had restored from being the town garbage dump and absolutely denuded wasteland into thick forest. I had residential leopards, I had visiting tigers, I had over 300 deer on the land, um, all sorts of interesting creatures, over oh, you know, 160 species of birds. It became magical, but it just consumed my life. In 2014, due to many different circumstances, I decided to sell it. And I then ended up in the strange position where my husband wanted a divorce. I had sold Singinava. My parents had to sell the family house. And I'd given up academics. And I did really didn't know what to do. So I was standing at this crossroads thinking of what am I going to do next? And it was at that moment in time, I went through about a year and a half of, you know, being really feeling very sorry for myself. Then one day woke up and said, hey, this is perfect. The slate's wiped clean. I have all the money from the lodge I sold. Let me make a wish list and let's get to work on the wish list. And I started listing everything I wanted to do and got to about 82 and I sort of stopped. <laughs> but I've made, I've made good inroads into that list. So one of the things that I wanted to do was to photograph and study every big cat of the world. So this is my present list. The only one missing is the pumas, which I will go to this year. So I have been from, you know, the, the tropical rainforest to high altitude mountains to different continents. I spent three months in the Amazon with friends of mine from Panthera who are doing work on jaguars. I've uh, been in Africa with lots of my friends who work on lions. I've uh, been, well, besides the cats, I've also been doing other stuff. So I was involved with trying to save the last few northern black rhinos. There was one in, in the San Diego Zoo and three in Old Pejeta Conservancy in Kenya, but that, that's it, four. Now, Two have died, so there's only two left. But I've been working with them very closely. I've been involved with a lot of programs to do with elephant conservation. I've been working on small cat species, but this has been my passion. Okay, so the top left is a jaguar. Uh, South America and the Amazon. Um, bottom left is the snow leopard, 
next to that is the tiger, cheetah, clouded leopard, corner leopard, top lion. So this is um, this is the entire list, and there's as I said, only puma is missing the from the great kids. And the, other one is found where? the clouded leopard is found <coughs> in the tropical rainforest from the northeast of India all the way through to Borneo, Thailand, Malaysia, that belt, and very very elusive because it's primarily arboreal, and he's it's it's a small, I mean compared to the tiger, he's a little fellow. Um, if he stands, he's about um, little bigger than a spaniel, and low and long with a long tail. Okay, so not not big at all. I mean, like a like a Labrador that's uh, shrunk a bit. <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, so um, I snow leopard. What about it? Of all the Himalayas, every country that has the Himalayas has snow leopards. So only found in the Himalayas. Okay, so I um, have one of the problems I had, and you know, as I said, I've been telling you, it's not been easy. I've been going through up and down. One of the problems I had was that my ex-husband refused to let me take photographs. It was just one of the things in his head, and that was one of the things he liked, and he would never let me do it. So from the time that we got married in 2000 to 2012 when film cameras turned to di digital cameras I didn't pick up a camera and this was a very tough thing for me and and then in 2012 when I you know faced all of this and I borrowed a camera from my dad in 2014 I finally said okay let's give it a go so I've never learned photography I've never been a professional but today, I'm an icon professional, one of 25 in India. I work for Leica. I do some stuff for them. I'm, my wildlife photography has been acknowledged as having a certain quality that's very much my own. So thank you. And it was a big surprise, right? Because I would take these pictures and I would put them on Facebook very, very hesitantly, you know, one picture. And then some people would write in and one more picture and it just it grew like that and friends and people and other photographers started to writing to me and and that's how it progressed um, so I'm going to show you some of my photographs and talk to you about the cats right and try and tell you what the cats mean to me and and how I see them differently from from many other people so tigers the largest cats in the world okay the tiger is a very self-contained gentleman. He minds his own business. He really doesn't want to have anything to do with human beings. Um, he'll beg your pardon and, and you know, go off from the side to avoid you. He'll only get hassled if you encroach upon personal space and he doesn't have an alternative to escape. Okay, that's the tiger. Okay, and they're cautious hunters. They're they're not wasteful. They'll kill one and they'll eat it for as long as it lasts. Um, and all of this stuff about they don't scavenge and stuff, not true. They'll eat anything, anything, a roadkill, uh, leftovers from a leopard, whatever's going. They'll eat frogs. They'll eat snakes. They'll eat birds. They'll eat anything. And um, they're each tiger is like a dog every tiger has his own personality every tiger has his own thoughts and so there was this big male tiger called charger um, he had a territory of about 105 square kilometers and you know big tough guy and it was all about you know making an impression as you enter the room so big shoulders big rough and then it dwindled down to this little back you know but that didn't matter because he'd made that impression and he was called Charger because he would come for you. But if you got out of the car and you walked on foot, he'd tuck his tail between his legs and out of there. <laughs> okay? So the bravado was all against vehicles and motorcycles and elephants and all of that. And Charger was, you know, this really serious guy, 105 square kilometers, the lord of all his surveys. And, but he was quirky. 
and he was a nut. So one day I was following him on an elephant and it was in Madhya Pradesh, leaf fall and sort of the autumn type environment happens immediately after winter. So first the leaves fall and then you go into spring. And so after winter, there's all these leaves had fallen and we were at the top of this little hillock and uh, Charger decided that he wanted to run noisily through all this leaf litter. And tigers are not supposed to do that. They're supposed to be quiet and stealthy and, you know, sneak up on things. And he looked at me and he had these crazy yellow eyes, like the Paul Newman of tigers, you know. Big yellow eyes, he looked at me, grinned and went zook down. And he skidded to a halt in the middle of a group of cheetal. And this little cheetal fawn was under his chin. And he looked at it, looked at me and said, you didn't see that and walked off. <laughs> he didn't kill the deer. He was just having fun. So, you know, tigers have these little quirks and they're amazing, amazing animals when you get to know them. What so is the Okay, so this is, okay, so I'm going to go to the next one. The tiger spray marking their territory. So they spray urine on prominent trees in their path to leave messages for other tigers to smell, to know that this is taken territory and it's not available for grabs. Now when a tiger smells the pheromones on a spray marking, they have this thing called the vomeronasal gland which is located on the upper palate of the mouth and it pushes the pheromones into that so they can analyze it better and tell which tiger it is. And this is called the Flemen reaction, F-L-E-H-M-E-N. And you will see it not only in tigers but even horses and dogs and, lo and cats, all cats of course. Yeah, so this is, this is a part, this grimace is a part of the Flemen reaction. Okay, now this is um, uh, the sneaky peaky tiger. Okay, I mean, he, he was trying to pretend that, you know, I couldn't see him, but sneaky peaky. So this actually became the cover of my book, which was released in May um, last year. And this picture was selected to be a part of the largest <coughs> exhibition on tigers in the world, which took place in the Royal Albert Hall earlier this year with 37 of the greatest wildlife photographers of the world. So that was amazing. So, the sneaky peaky tiger. Okay, so, you know, every picture has a story. Every picture will talk to you. I don't do just portraits. It's showing you what the tigers are about. They're big cuddly cats. I mean, you know, they're just, they're amazing. And at moments like this, when a tiger has seen something and it's making up its mind and it's focusing, everything goes still. Even the leaves stop falling. Every molecule in the body is attuned to what he's seen and you hold your breath. And only sometimes will the tiger charge. Most of the time it will make up its mind and say it's not, too, not going to happen or some monkey or some deer or some bird will give an alarm call and give up, give away the game. So this is the moment when it sees something. Most of the days they spend like this, sitting somewhere peacefully, resting, surveying their territory. Now what people don't realize is that tigers are a number, sorry, no, if we, if we do go slower, you're not going to see them all. <laughs> we can leave them running. We can leave a copy for people to see. Yeah, We'll leave a copy. I can put it online. You can have a look at them. Okay, so tigers live in some of the most important habitats of India with over 300 rivers originating from the areas that tigers live in. So the water security of the nation has a lot to do with conserving tiger habitat. And, and that's why we use an umbrella species that is probably one of the most well recognized animals in the world to talk about conservation and ecology in India and, and watershed management. Okay. So you know how I took this, right? I was on the floor, I had my lens on the ground, 
little bit away from the tiger, nose to nose, and we eyeballed each other, and I took the picture. <laughs> yeah, so this is the incredible thing. I mean, here you have this orange and black and white cat, and it disappears. You blink, and it disappears. It's amazing. And, and bathtubs are very welcome in the summer when it's really hard. They're very strong swimmers. They can swim upstream, across rivers. They love soaking in water. You'll often find mothers and cubs having a really good time sitting in water and playing games. Going from the tiger to one of the least known animals, the ghosts of the Himalayas, the snow leopard. We still don't know how many exist. They're highly endangered, threatened all over their range. Very few people see them. I wanted to be blessed with the sighting. I, it took me a long time. I had to acclimatize because it was really high altitude. And so I, I spent a month acclimatizing and doing short walks. And you know, I carry a lot of gear. I can't take these pictures without gear. So my camera bag weighs about 26 kilos. In addition to that, I have a lens that's 5 kilos plus um, a tripod plus the all of the gear that goes with it and the camera. So the whole thing is about 12 kilos. So 26 plus 12. So I always have to take a porter. I always need people. And you know, I have the, my lenses. So all my lenses have names. So um, the 800 mm is about that size. And he's like a prehistoric monster. So he's named after the Flintstones. He's called Fred. <laughs> and um, then I have the, the one zoom lens, which is the AT400, which is my standard go-to lens, which I can use the whole day without getting tired. And he's called Get a Fix, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And, and then I bought a new lens, which is the latest Nikon lens, which is the 500 mm prime, which is the smallest, lightest 500 mm in the world. And he's called Just for Kicks. <laughs> okay, so all my lenses have names and they all go with me. But Fred, because he's costs an arm and a leg and the car, normally has to have his own seat in planes. And so I have to buy two seats to travel, especially when you go to Africa and you're in the little planes, because they only say seven kilos in the hand and, you know, 26 plus 12. So you pay for another seat. And Fred goes with me everywhere. So. It's because I had Fred, I could get these pictures. And um, I just wasn't sure that I would ever get to see a snow leopard. And we would go out every day. And these people would be, there would be five guides with their wireless sets. And they would look for track. And they would go off in the mountains. And you saw the pictures right in the beginning of us looking for them. And one day, we, we saw a movement right on top of the ridge. And it was this, we thought it was a cat. Okay, and they're gray. So you, if you blink, you lose them. And took out the binos, and it was a snow leopard. And that snow leopard is called Giamo, and had a black eye because she has tumor in one eye. And she spent the whole day talking to us and walking down the mountain to us. And it took her the whole day. And at 6.30 in the evening, she had come to within 50 feet of me. It was amazing. It was, I mean, I died and went to heaven. If I had died that day, I would have, you know, been a happy person. Because it was just so amazing to have this animal just come out there in the open. And this is not Gyamu. This is Tai Lung from Kung Fu Panda because he's just such a different beast. You don't want to meet this guy at night on your own on the mountainside. And these magpies, he had killed two calves near a village. And we got to know, and we went there, and he was sitting there. And there was this whole flock of magpies, and they were really bugging him. So much so that they would hop right up to him, pick up his tail by the end fur, and drop it down. And he was looking at them, going, I'm going to get you for a snack. I really want a snack now. <laughs> so this is Tai Lung, and he's a very different beast. So I ended up seeing five snow leopards. And um, this is Gyamo with her little black eye. And she's so beautiful. I mean, look at the polka dotted feet, you know. She's gorgeous. And she would have this whole conversation. And I managed to do a lot of video with this. 
and it's actually been made into a, a film which has been winning awards everywhere with Mike Pandey and his son Gautam Pandey and it's called Gyamo, it's on Animal Planet, it's available on YouTube, please have a look, most of the video footage of snow leopards is mine. This is Tai Lung, see, cute and cuddly, yeah. not cute and cuddly, <laughs> you know, okay, cheetahs, they're not dogs and they're not cats, they're dots, they're dogs in a cat's body, they don't have claws that retract, they have tiny little faces, they can't roar, they're the only big cats that can't roar, they chirp, they actually chirp, they can't roar. And they're gorgeous. They're just unbelievable. The first cheetah I saw, I went with my dad. I finally got to Africa because I'd sold the lodge and I was not shackled anymore. And I saw a cheetah with three little babies. And my dad just didn't take any pictures. He just sat there and cried because I was crying over my camera and taking pictures. I was just so overcome that I had actually managed to see a cheetah in the wild. You know, it was like a big dream. Now this young man is a, is a cheetah called Martin and he killed a wildebeest in front of us. There were two brothers who lived together and Martin had just lost his brother a few months ago because they got um, canine distemper and he wasn't diagnosed in time so they lost the brother. But, and he was living in this area with a big pride of lions so we were very worried about him. But that day he made it this wildebeest kill and then grabbed the wildebeest and got it to right next to my car. If I put out Fred, I would have bopped him on the nose <laughs> and, and opened it and therefore this picture because I couldn't zoom out enough. I mean, there was no zoom on the, you know, it was, this was it. And um, this is cheetahs, the fastest hunters in the world. Absolutely incredible. This was Botswana this time. And, uh, you know, we managed to get all of this. So that little cheetah had been trained by her mother to pose perfectly. <laughs> you know? And she wasn't breathing. She gave me left profile, right profile, front <laughs> profile. And, you know, just, just look at her. I mean, even her feet are aligned. Yeah. And, and this is one of the other cheetahs. They're just gorgeous. I mean, I wish we had cheetahs in India, but the last one was killed actually outside Bandavgarh by Babu Sab Tala, 1954, the last Asiatic cheetah. And we got an offer and an opportunity for getting and reintroducing the Asiatic cheetah back into India because there are still some left in Iraq. And the Iraq royal family agreed to give India some Asiatic cheetahs, not the African ones, in exchange for some Asiatic lions. And um, you know, the powers that be, and I don't need to name who they are, decided that they were only Gujarati lions and they would live in Gujarat. <laughs> so none were given and we never got any cheetahs. Look at them. You know, they're just amazing. This is the clouded leopard. I have only this one time I saw them in Tripura in a forest in Tripura and it was just, it was magic and it appeared and it disappeared and these are the only pictures I've seen and they have these wonderful sort of square patches on them and very, very different uh, looking. Leopards, the most feline and the most successful cat of the big cats. Leopards are thinking cats. A leopard will walk into this room, will climb up a tree, climb into the veranda, come here, pick up a dog from here and walk past and go out. Tiger will never do that. Leopards will do that. So they're a very different creature altogether. And which is why you have so many instances of leopards living in Bombay next to people, leopards in Delhi, leopards all over the place. Because they, they can work around human beings. And they think and they plan and they strategize. Other cats don't do that. This was a beautiful female in Ranthambo and the deer was actually bigger than her. She got it and she ate a little bit and then a tiger arrived and claimed. I spent three weeks on top of a granite hill in Rajasthan and then she brought them out to show me three beautiful babies.
Okay, so I don't know who was watching who, but <laughs> we kept a careful eye on each other. I was driving in Rajasthan one day, went round a corner, and this thing was in the middle of the road with a goat it had killed. I don't know who was more startled, this young leopard or me. But because it was trapped in the lights, the headlights of the car, I managed to get all these pictures. These are leopards in, in Rajasthan in a place called Beda. The only leopards which have had no conflict with human beings. They actually live there very peacefully, only population in the world that I know of that does this. And they'll, you'll find a temple and a village group of people doing jagran and a leopard sitting and watching the whole thing. <laughs> it's just, it's amazing. I mean, you should really, you should go online and have a look. It's incredible. Okay. So that's, you know, day, night, moonlit nights, dark night. From the headlights of the car? It's hitting the leopard and that's the shadow behind it on the granite. <coughs> yeah. Lions. Totally different to everything we've seen so far because they live in groups, social cats. You can have prides of 20, 30, 40, 80 lions. Okay, so the whole strategy is different. It's about might is right and group power. You know, and it's it's about coalitions and and family politics and you know all of that sort of thing. Very yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and takeovers. <laughs> so these are you know images of lions. And there are some areas in the world where you still have some tree climbing lions. They're found only in one or two places. And um, this was in Manyara, so you have the tree climbing lions of Manyara. The rest of the places, the lions don't climb trees. So the lions stored their food up in trees. They use them as larders. And uh, the, the leopards, sorry, and the lions hang around at the bottom. But in Manyara, they go up. Africa. Okay, the deepest, darkest Amazon, the jaguar, very different to the leopard. It's almost like a young subadult tiger, big, built, stocky, powerful, huge head, the strongest jaws in the world. I saw a jaguar climb up on a tree, 30 foot above a river, dive into the river, grab a caiman, which is a type of crocodile, which is bigger than it, and take it out on the bank and kill it. So absolutely incredible. Every cat has its own conservation story. These guys are being threatened by the cattle ranchers because their habitat is being felled to grow grass for the beef industry of those parts of the world. So huge threat to these animals there. And they walk along the river bank, right on the edge. And they keep looking down to see what there is. Is there a caiman? Is there a, a capybara? And wherever they see something, they'll dive into the river, even a, even a giant otter. And they will take them on. They're absolutely amazing. You know? So, and this is, um, it's a different type of thing altogether because I went to look for jaguars in Peru and I went to look for jaguars in Brazil. In Brazil, we were on the Amazon in boats. In Peru, we were actually hiking through the forest. So it was a very, very different experience and thick forest, I mean, unreal forest. So I haven't quite figured out whether I do my photography because I travel or I travel because I, you know. It's just one of those things, but I travel a lot. And I go across continents and I have all these plans for doing things in the future, but I don't do just cats. This picture on the left has just won an award um, in the Royal Geographical Society. Um, we've done a book 
called the Remembering the Great Apes with all the great apes of the world. At the inauguration of and, and the launch of this book, we raised a hundred thousand pounds for great ape conservation and we had Jane Goodall and we had so many people there and they're benefiting straight from this money. And again, some of the people who are absolute legends with uh, great ape conservation were there. And I'm really, really happy that this was a part of it. Um, orangutans in Borneo, um, one of the, the people who works on the orangutans is Tim Laman and his wife. And they've set up the, the, one of the sanctuaries in Borneo. And he won the Wildlife Photographer of the Year Award for some of his work on orangutans last year. And orangutans are like the maddest looking circus trapeze artists I have ever seen. They'll go up this thing that looks like a bamboo stalk right to the top and it's like a 80 feet high and there's a thing and then he'll shake it and he'll hold it with one foot and one hand and he'll lean and he forms this triangle and they lean down and it swings back and he leans down and it swings back and he builds up this momentum like a pendulum and then grabs the next tree and you know you, you just wonder why it's not broken and what has happened and you know how they live it's just amazing and these little guys hold on you know and they're going through all of this and I mean I'm just I don't know how they don't get seasick you know it's just amazing I also do a lot of bird photography I'm a very keen bird watcher I've gone all over the world taking bird photographs um, this is a ground hornbill great big things sort of bigger than turkeys in Africa and this is a blood pheasant in in Bhutan and um, we had this we had recorded the sound of a blood pheasant and we wanted to see what would happen and he started doing this little parikrama around me <laughs> you know I know there's a female there I can hear it I know it's there I'll go anti-clockwise no I'll go clockwise and then every now and then he would stand in front of me and yell at me you know sort of eyeball to eyeball I know it's there I know it's there and I'm, I'm ruffling up my feathers I'm just such a cool guy but I know there's that female you got her hidden somewhere it was amazing so I spent over two hours with this bird and I've got like a whole series of photographs of this guy in action but you know birds are like crazy I mean the the rollers are just from all over the world I mean you get them in India the Nilkant the Indian roller 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 yeah and they call the roller because when they get off their perch and they want to catch insects sometimes they do rolls like the the planes do you've seen the Air Force planes on yeah. Um, yeah so they do things like that that's why they call rollers um, and of course owls I love owls I mean any type of owl <laughs> They're just amazing. And the little babies. <laughs> um, she's actually at the bottom. You can see the gray wings. She's um, a, a magpie. And she was flying. And so it's got blurred. And this was up in Ladakh. The rose finch. You know, so I mean, it's I, I photograph now, I think about close to a thousand species of birds all over the world and the more you photograph them the more you find them amazing and you know I use them to give talks and and to to make people interested in seeing what's going on yeah the babies uh, this is the Himalayan magpie I'd shown you pictures right up front earlier you remember yeah 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 No, it's it's. It builds uh, on poplar trees and it builds stories. Yeah, but uh, year. it was. Uh, this looks like a rock face. And it is a rock face, and we thought it was, but this bird was coming and going, so I don't know whether it was attacking it or it was its nest, but that's what we were told. I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Ladakh. Huh. This is definitely not the uh, the magpies. It looks more like a martin to me, a yeah, house martin. One of those, yeah. House martin, but. Okay, underwater. So I do a lot of underwater photography and um, all over the world. My latest trip was to Raja Ampat, which is where the Pacific Ocean meets the Indian Ocean. And the. 
in beyond Borneo in P Papua New Guinea. Yeah, so this is um, again stuff. This is from the Andamans. A lot of this is the Andamans. The center picture is uh, Raja Ampert. <coughs> Again, recording what's happening to the corals. I, I do a lot of work on climate change, so that's the easiest way of seeing what is going on. Um, and I've been doing a lot of this photography and you know, working to see what sites remain, how global warming is affecting them in different parts. So I, I don't restrict myself to any one genre. I do a lot of landscape photography as well. This is Ladakh, as you'll probably recognize. This is on the way to Sokar, the Pangong Lake. Scenes from Ladakh. Um, I don't know if you know about the living bridges of Meghale. Yes. Yeah, so these are the double-decker <coughs> bridge and one of the living bridges of Meghale. I had gone there. Um, I also do a lot of sepia and black and white photography. Um, big collections again I've done books with this this is the film I was talking about um, I don't know how we're doing for time how are we doing for time okay cool 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 so this is the film I'm talking about and uh, it's available online and it's on the snow leopard and what um, development is uh, issues are causing um, problems for the snow leopard now in areas like Ladakh so it's focusing on things like that that's my book um, it's called Hidden India. Um, this book supports the work of the Wildlife SOS and specifically their elephant conservation project. Um, I did this book earlier this year, um, basically as an introduction to what the wild spaces of India are. So it covers birds, animals, landscapes, underwater. It's just an introduction to, to Indian wildlife and wilderness. This is my new book, totally, totally different to what I'm, I've been doing till date. This is due for release um, at the Jaipur Literary Festival. It's five volumes, a box series on the tribes of Ethiopia. And that was an incredible journey. Ethiopia was just the most amazing place I had ever been to and one of the most difficult places I have ever worked in. And I worked with uh, photographing, uh, sorry, so I worked with photographing eight tribes. And these tribes are, have been isolated pretty much from civilization until very recently. And the Ethiopian government has handed over huge tracts of land in and around where these tribes live to the Chinese government for sugarcane and cotton plantations. Now this, I discovered this area because when I was going to Ethiopia, I wanted to photograph the Ethiopian wolf. But the other thing I wanted to do was to actually go to the site where they found Lucy, the earliest hominid ancestor of man. And she was found in this place called Hadar, which is very close to Omo. And doing online research for Hadar, I found Omo and then I wanted to go there. And uh, there's two national parks that these tribes live in and around. One is called Mago and the other is called Omo. And the Chinese government has gone in and clear fell two thirds of Mago National Park. I, every nightmare story you have heard about Africa happened and unfolded in front of my eyes right there. It was crazy. And you, you walk in and there's these bulldozed roads which are like four lane highways, dirt tracks. And every crossroad, there's these armed guerrilla warriors with AK-47s, okay? And, and really, I mean, those three-quarter pants torn, lace-up boots, shirts open, big AK-47 gun belt with bullets around them. And you really don't know what you're doing, okay? And I had gone on my own. I had this one local guide and one driver. And I had hired this Land Rover and I had gone off. And the day I arrived there, they declared a political emergency. The country shut down. There was no means of communication. My parents didn't know what I was doing. It was crazy. It was 45 degrees centigrade. I, there was no place to stay. There's no infrastructure there. So you're living in different people's houses in the village. And um, going to see all of these. And these people would literally come and just go through your car, see what they wanted. And you were at their mercy. And you, you know. One of these places, I'll show you the tribe. 
I was there early morning at 7.30, 8 o'clock a truck arrived, they sh shepherded all these people in it and took them to work as manual laborers on the plantations. And then to water these plantations, they are now building the five largest dams in Ethiopia, which is also going to inundate the Omo National Park below. So I felt that I really needed to document all of this and this series of books resulted as a because of that. Uh, yeah. It's earth colors. So they just use no natural minerals. I'll show you more pictures. And they just grind them on the riverside on rocks and make this paste and decorate themselves. They're just absolute masters of body art. They're absolutely incredible. So this is the eye of the tiger at the Royal Albert Hall that I mentioned. Um, and then I did the Omo exhibition, the prelude to the Omo exhibition was this year in Delhi. And this gentleman is a very well known photographer, he is called Steve McCurry. And he did that really famous picture of the Afghan girl for the National oh, Geographic yeah. cover. Yes. And Steve inaugurated my exhibition, he was in India and he had just been to Omo. So it was fabulous because we could compare notes and discuss where we had gone. and. You know, he, I had managed to film some stuff that he had not managed to film and uh, it was just, it was one of the most enchanting evenings of my life that I was actually standing in front of this man mm -hmm. and discussing photography with him. It was surreal. Uh, this is, you know who she is, <laughs> Ellen DeGeneres with the book Remembering Great Apes at the Ellen Show. This is the book we've done. That's one of my photographs in the book. This is my exhibition just concluded last month in uh, Bikaner House in Delhi, 230 photographs. Um, they called it a solo group show because it was just such a large piece of work. And these are the tribals that I had photographed. I'm just going to show you very few pictures because I have in the books there are 1250 pictures. I didn't know how many of you would be interested in this. so. I went there I it to get to this this particular tribe I had it took me a year to arrange permissions and the logistics I had to charter an aircraft fly two and a half hours drive six hours and it hired someone from Addis Ababa to take three Land Rovers full of supplies to set up camp in this place because there was just no place to live and we had to hire local guerrilla warriors with their guns to protect us because it's right on the border of Sudan. So great political unrest, also bordering an area where the Ethiopian government has been practicing genocide. I actually had a situation where I got fired at by an AK-47. So all sorts of madness and I got there after that six hour, nine hour journey, went into my tent, came out holding one little camera and saw this and just it just be, oh, was all worthwhile you know it was just <laughs> look at this what is the uh, i mean how 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 are permissions worked out with indigenous groups like this you don't how work out the permissions with the indigenous groups you work out the permission with the government no, no. indigenous people also have Absolutely. And if they if you if they say no, you don't take it. You can't go and I don't have I went in as a absolutely as a journalist style photo documentary artist. I did not interact, I did not talk. I and the people I took with me were local people. There were tribes I could not photograph, so there are tribes I have not photographed. There were some who were willing to be photographed and there were others who did not want to be photographed. So you just respect that and you work with what you get. You know, but nothing was set up. The, what I've realized is if you go in there and you actually start questioning and interacting and going in, it's a changed behavior. It's not what they're doing in their daily lives. So I just would go in and I would live there for a month, walk to these areas, the local guide who spoke the local language would get permission from a village. If they said yes, I would spend the day there. If they said no, I would go back and go to the next place. 
So that's how I worked. And you know, little bits of civilization coming in. Look at the tic tacs. They still wear goat skin, a lot of them. So on the right is the goat skin. And uh, this was a ceremony where they, it was a coming of age ceremony of one of the boys in the village. And they tie these uh, bells around their legs uh, when they dance. A part of the ceremony is that the women get whipped and they make their own whips. It was one of the most difficult things for me to see. And this is when they had made the whips and they were, you know. So they whipped themselves? No, the men whipped mm -hmm. the women. Coming of age of the man, he whips the women. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'll, we can talk about it at length later. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, there's each tribe has a story and there are many stories to tell. So, um, yeah, this is all, handmade. all everything is handmade. So that, that piece of the, cloth is the, the piece of cloth is probably bought from the local thing, and sh she's wearing a t shirt. And don't miss the watch strap joined up and hung in the front. <laughs> yeah, so this group of people were on the edge of a town, and they had worn these to prevent th when, when the whipping is going on to protect their, their upper chest. The back they tie it up, so the, you can see the t-shirt around her neck, right? So the back is exposed but the front is covered. And you know, genital mutilation, lip plates, all of that. But it was, it was an incredibly different, difficult thing to do. But that's me and um, I've got lots of projects in the offing. I'm doing one on the poles, the North Pole and the South Pole called Poles Apart when I'm studying the effects of global warming. On the North Pole and the South Pole, I'm doing a project in Galapagos, um, the Puma project, of course, to complete my great cat list and then start on the subspecies. The next one is the Siberian tiger. So um, lots of plans. I always have things to do, but um, I do offbeat stuff. I just wake up one morning and say, this is what I want to do and I do it. And I move from project to project. and. With every project I do, I ensure that there's a giving back component. So I went to photograph the chimpanzees. We've contributed to the book. We're fundraising through that. And I'm contributing back to great ape conservation, both for the orangutans and the chimpanzees. The book that I wrote is funding elephant conservation through the Wildlife SOS for elephants that have been abused and rescued. The, all the work that I do in Kana is with the communities again giving back to the communities. I don't take even one rupee from what I raise from them. It just goes a hundred percent straight there, uh, which is why I don't work with other people. I just do everything myself and uh, you know, because I know that I don't need the money. So it's, it's guaranteed that it's going back. Um, so every one of these projects has a giving back component. So I'm um, happy to answer any questions.